electric cars. They represent the biggest change to our everyday transport since we swapped horses for horsepower. They're fast, silent and cost efficient to run. But while they come with many benefits, it's still early days. So we have plenty to learn and some barriers to still overcome. That's right. If you're thinking of your next vehicle purchase being an electric car or even the one after that, there's some research you need to do. You need to find out where you're going to charge it, how you're going to charge it. You need to take a look at the kind of driving that you're likely to do. And all of that is part of getting the best deal and making the smartest purchase for you and your family. So while there's a lot to learn, the journey towards the purchase of an electric vehicle should be a fun one. So let's get Australia ready for electric vehicles. Welcome to Drive Electric. In this show, we'll take you into the brand new world of electric vehicles, or EVs. We'll explain the types of electric vehicles. We'll look at charging both on the road and at home. And we'll speak to the expert minds in the electric vehicle game to get a better understanding of the challenges we face right now, but also the opportunities for the future. We'll answer the biggest questions you have and show you where EVs work, where they don't work, in a country like Australia. Of course, we'll have some fun along the way, getting to know some new cars, and we'll find out that electrification is more than just silent running. So to kick things off, let's start with the basics and look at the three main types of electric vehicles. But if you think electric cars are brand new, think again, they've been around for a while. In fact, if you've driven in a taxi or a rideshare vehicle, chances are you've experienced a hybrid, which is the most common form of electrification in a modern vehicle. The hybrid system pairs a small battery pack and an electric motor to the traditional petrol engine. And crucially, it brings more efficiency, especially around town, where the hybrid system helps the petrol engine be as efficient as it possibly can. But the key here for owners is that you don't have to change your driving habits. It's trouble-free, stress-free. Just put the petrol in the car and drive as you normally would. Brands like Toyota and Lexus have been building hybrids for over 20 years. And like we said, if you've driven in a Toyota Camry taxi, chances are you've already dipped your toe in the hybrid water. If you really want to get into it, there's another level to hybrids called a mild hybrid. You can scan the QR code and head over to drive.com.au to find out all about those, because right now we're about to take it up a notch. And in this new landscape of electric vehicles, this could be the perfect two-car garage. Full electric for trips around town, and then petrol backup for longer road trips. But in the meantime, after the break, we're going to teach you all about the FEV, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. We're taking you on a drive through the biggest change we've ever seen in motoring, the world of electric vehicles. Now you can find out everything you need to know at drive.com.au. But in the meantime, sit back, plug in and get ready because we're taking you on a drive into the future. Now, if you want an electric car, but you need the flexibility of being able to drive longer distances, a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, or FEV, might be just the ticket to avoiding the dreaded range anxiety. As the name suggests, a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle pairs a larger battery than a regular hybrid with a regular petrol engine, and you need to plug it into charge, but it'll give you a certain amount of electric-only range. This allows you to cover a certain distance on pure electric power alone, and then switch to the petrol engine for either added performance or longer range. There's plenty of benefits to owning a plug-in hybrid in Australia, where you get the flexibility of doing all your running around town on pure electric power alone. You can charge up at home overnight, but then you get the best of both worlds by having that range ability to go on a longer drive with the regular petrol engine. Brands like Peugeot, Kia, Mitsubishi, Mini, BMW and others offer the flexibility of a plug-in hybrid through their range. The electric-only range of our Peugeot 3008 is 60 kilometres. Now, while that might not sound like much, 
The key factor is that most Australians commute 20 kilometres each way to work. That means that you can drive from home to work and back every day and not use any petrol at all. You just need somewhere to charge it when you're done and that's a whole new conversation. If you're lucky enough to own your own home with a garage or driveway, then it shouldn't be too difficult to install your very own electric vehicle charger. We've come to chat to a regular electric vehicle owner, Mark Butterworth, at his house to find out what it's been like owning an electric vehicle and whether he's had any challenges. Mark, tell us about your home electric vehicle charging setup. I've been fortunate to be able to set up just a, uh, a wall outlet charger uh, just behind me at the side of the house. There's a, um, a switchboard which we've been able to run a, a line to the wall charger. I looked at the options, so certainly uh, while I haven't gone down the upgrade path, I did look at what it would cost to potentially run a three phase into the house a little prohibitive, um, so I've stuck with the, um, the single phase line. I did look at where potentially, you know, the vehicle um, would be best parked, the right cable length, whether the outlet should be, you know, closer maybe to the, to the front of the property. How quickly does it recharge your car? So from about 20% up to 90, which is the, uh, the recommended uh, charge for the vehicle, um, it's about, you know, seven kilowatts an hour coming out of the, the wall box. So generally somewhere maybe five to six hours. Um, if you were coming from zero to 100, you know, you're looking at, you know, eight to nine hours. Are there any issues with having a charger outside in the elements? No, it's designed for outdoor installation. Um, it has been installed in a relatively protected area. Do you have a rough cost of the installation and where does your energy come from? Yeah, look, I, um, <laughs> my job is in procurement, so I did um, quite a bit of looking around at, at various suppliers. Um, Ultimately, you're probably going to be paying anywhere from sort of, you know, eight to nine hundred up to fifteen hundred. Um, by the time I, um, you know, looked at getting a longer cable, and we might talk about the cable in terms of its cost, but it's about twelve hundred dollars, and then maybe another five to six hundred to uh, to get it installed. We've had a, a solar system on the property now for the last seven or eight years, a small one. Um, I've just recently had that upgraded now to a six to seven kilowatt system, partly because of obviously having the vehicle and looking to, to offset the cost there. So ultimately, yes, if I can configure the charging through the day, then hopefully we'll have a, a zero cost going forward. If you're a brand new EV driver and you've just bought an electric car, you're excited to drive it and you're wondering how to charge it, probably the first thing you should know is that you can charge at home. And if you have access to off-street parking, which many Australians do and many people who buy electric vehicles do, um, you can do everything from plugging it into a dedicated power point for your uh, electric vehicle, so literally plug it into the power point, or uh, you install a home charger, which charges much faster. And you can do pretty much all of your charging at home. And the great news also is that if you've got solar on the roof, which from our studies around 60 to 70% of EV drivers have, you can actually take the excess solar from the rooftop and charge your car for free. And Australia is in a better position to absorb EVs than others because not many people would know, but we actually have one of the most advanced grids in the world. We actually have a grid that's transitioning to renewables at one of the fastest rates in the world and that we are probably one of the best suited to absorb more electric vehicles because of how much rooftop solar we have uh, in the market. In South Australia, for example, on some days, rooftop solar meets 100% of electricity needs for that entire state. And so when you consider that people can actually charge their vehicle from solar, it means that we actually already have the generation capacity for a lot of people to transition to electric vehicles without needing to do much else. They just have to absorb the solar that's on their roof and instead of sending it back into the grid, they charge their electric vehicles with it. But if you can't install your own wall box or are parking the car at work, the only thing you need to charge it up is one of these. The upside to a plug-in hybrid is that everywhere you've got a power point, well, you've got a charger. The downside is that most charging options for plug-in hybrid vehicles are quite slow. Now that's fine if you've got somewhere to park your vehicle overnight so you can charge it while you're at home or all day at work. But if you want to be able to put a real quick boost of electricity into a battery pack, you're going to need to make the big step up to a full electric vehicle. When 
we talk about charging, how fast is fast? Are you ready for some high voltage high school physics? You can calculate power by multiplying volts times amps. So with our wall plug, which is 240 volt on a standard 10 amp circuit, it's capable of producing 2.4 kilowatts of power. So use that over time and you'll get 2.4 kilowatts per hour or 2.4 kilowatt hours, which measures energy. If your electric vehicle has a 24 kilowatt hour battery at 2.4 kilowatts per hour, it will take you a minimum of 10 hours to get from zero to 100%. A properly installed wall box uses a 30 amp circuit, which gives you up to seven kilowatts per hour. So that takes the same example down to 3.5 hours. A fully electric car like this, the EV6, has a bigger battery, which means more power and longer range. It also means that plugging it into a wall to charge won't cut it, especially when you're in a hurry. In reality, though, you probably won't use your entire battery charge in one single day. So with a 77 kilowatt hour battery that's in the Kia EV6 as an example, you'd probably be quite happy to plug it in and top it up at home overnight. Now, when you're on the road, though, different story because rapid fast chargers are the way you want to go. Speaking of rapid and fast, they are two words that are another benefit for electric vehicles. So let's just park the science for a moment and have some fun. We're getting ready for electric vehicles. For more information about electric vehicle charge times and battery science, scan the QR code and head over to drive.com.au. Now, drag racing isn't something that most of us do in our daily driving. And while living your life a quarter mile at a time doesn't really help with the weekly shop, it is an excellent way to demonstrate the performance credentials of a vehicle. Case in point, this is a RAV4 hybrid. Petrol engine up front, small battery and electric motors beneath the floor. Now, it's good for a 0 to 100 km an hour time of around eight seconds. And it's about to have its doors blown off by a Volvo. <laughs> wow. The Volvo XC40 Recharge Pure Electric may look just like a regular Volvo, but under that unassuming SUV body is a 78 kilowatt hour battery pack and a pair of electric motors that give this around twice the power of our RAV. Want some more context? This is a Subaru WRX, the enthusiast's icon. Under here is a 2.4 litre turbocharged four cylinder petrol engine. It was born for rally racing. It's all wheel drive. It's got a manual transmission. It is by all measure and reputation, a fast car and should then have no trouble dispatching a Volvo. fast, that thing. Oh. So how can an unassuming Volvo SUV outrun a focused, rally-bred, turbocharged weapon like a Subaru WRX? Well, I'm going to use this blender to give you what I hope is an easy explanation of that because an electric vehicle can go from zero to full power instantaneously. That means it doesn't have to build up like a petrol engine, and there's no lag like there can be with a turbocharged petrol engine. So it goes from nothing, as it is now, to full power, exactly like that. It's actually not too bad. Feel like some real acceleration? Our Volvo will do zero to 100 in 4.9 seconds, and Audi RS e-tron GT, it takes 3.3 seconds, and a Porsche Taycan Turbo S, It'll do zero to 100 in 2.8 seconds, but in some markets, and I guarantee this will move your internal organs around, a Tesla Model S Plaid, it takes just two seconds. But brutal acceleration isn't the only party trick of a modern electric vehicle.
This Mercedes-Benz AMG EQS 53 is a serious piece of technology with a big battery pack, multiple electric motors and three screens that take up the whole front of the dash. But beyond the technology, this car can be fast everywhere, it can be comfortable everywhere, it can be both. In fact, it can be anything you want it to be and that's thanks to the modernisation and the technology of that electric driveline. But previously, engineers had to work with the physical positioning of the engine, not just where it is in the vehicle, as in under the bonnet regularly, but also how that engine delivered its power and torque and whereabouts it was in the rev range. You don't have that with electric cars, whereas previously, petrol and diesel engines had one singular performance characteristic. With the electric motors in our AMG, the engineers can tailor the delivery of the power and torque to any individual wheel they pick and however they want it to be distributed when you're out there driving on the road. And furthermore, I can completely change the character of the AMG with the performance drive modes at the touch of a button. This means I can go from plush and docile to agile and a little bit angry at literally the push of a button. The way that these electric systems are built means that things like the power delivery, the rear wheel steering and even the throttle response make a very, very heavy vehicle because let's face it, this is heavy and it makes it feel almost, not quite, but almost like a pretty precise sports car. But this is a flagship and expensive Mercedes-Benz, so all of the technology, all of the smarts, we expect them. Those technological changes are all part of the new electric vehicle landscape and most importantly, they're not all directed at making the car faster. But the transition to EVs isn't just about the more expensive variants at the top end of the market, especially if the government wants more mass market cut through. So let's take a look at some of the other options if you're on a tighter budget. We've talked about performance and technology at the top of the electric car tree, but what does the landscape look like today and tomorrow for everyday motorists? Tell us a little bit about your job here at Hyundai. It's a bit of a unique one. It's, it's one we um, work towards preparing the market for future mobility, both electric cars and hydrogen fuel cell. From a manufacturer perspective, what's the most exciting part of this new consumer interest that we're seeing in electric vehicles? I think the, the most exciting part is seeing the change in people's attitudes towards their emission vehicles and knowing that uh, about 60 to 65% of people will consider an EV for the next vehicle, which is really incredible. The charging stations are really fast. You look at the 350 kilowatt, 800 volt stations and the car behind us, the Ionic 5, and all of our new Genesis and Ionic 6 can all do charging at that speed, as well as the Porsche Taycan. As a country, we need to actually look at where the stations need to be, look at those clusters of stations. We pat ourselves on the back for putting one station in, but I think we need to put five, 10, 20 stations in the same location. That's how you build a proper network. You've got to have redundancy on site. Yeah, I've always thought that when you're driving down the highway, you're accustomed to your fuel gauge getting low, you see a petrol station sign, that's where you go to fill up your car. Is adapting that existing infrastructure a significant part of the puzzle in terms of charging electric vehicles? I think so. Um, there's 7,000 petrol stations across Australia, all of them in fairly convenient locations. That's why they exist in the first place. And knowing that there's, you can get fresh food there and have a, use the conveniences there is a great place for going and filling up. But so was the shopping centre, so was McDonald's or KFC or any of your fast food chains. They're all potential service stations of the future, along with grocery stores. It's really important for us to ensure that we're installing EV chargers in the areas of high demand where they're most convenient for customers. So for every new service station and for all service stations we're retrofitting with EV chargers, EV charging demand is, is front of mind, um, as well as some of the other energy vectors that might, co might come forward in the future as well. Hyundai's always had a program of hydrogen that's been happening behind the scenes. Is that part of the future for Australia, do you think? 
hydrant's definitely part of the future and, and we established the first hydrant station in the Southern Hemisphere here in 2014. It gets replaced in uh, quarter one next year and we introduced the first vehicle. So we definitely see hydrant as part of the solution uh, in larger vehicles, but also in trucks, buses, trams, trains, ferries and commercial shipping. So is that the key that hydrogen makes a lot of sense for those sort of heavy vehicle applications? It is the heavier the mass of a vehicle, uh, whether it be on road, rail or marine or even aircraft. Uh, hydrogen is going to be um, better to propel that mass. It's really, the, the way to think about it is uh, EVs replace petrol today and hydrogen fuel cell replaces diesel. Do you think as consumers we need to understand that the cost of vehicle ownership is stepping up and we need to understand that it's going to cost us more money as a buyer or will the cost of the technology start to come back to what the market defines as being affordable? You need to have a lot of active and safe, uh, passive safety technology to meet uh, five star round caps. So cars are no longer that $20,000 drive away like they were with the i30 and the Corolla and the Cruise and all those other ones. So I think we've moved past that time. When you start to add in um, larger expensive batteries, the cars are going to be you know, expensive as they are today. The kilowatt hour per cost of battery is still fairly high at the moment, but as we get more infrastructure on the ground and we see more cars built. Um, we're using more of the same components across more drivetrains, both um, small, medium and passenger, um, across all of the Hyundai Motor Group brands. We're going to see um, that technology hopefully um, come down and be more affordable. We'll see a, a whole raft of new electric vehicles arriving in Australia. These cars are already being used in other markets around the world and we'll see them starting to arrive in Australia and, and of course there, there's more availability, there's more choice and some of them will be more affordable as well um, that we haven't quite um, achieved so far here in Australia. So um, so once that, that we, we, we reach that tipping point and I would say the tipping point is around about 10% uh, of, of the market, we'll see a, a, a really strong and, and rapid growth spurt on electric vehicles. So this is all well and good, providing that you've got the money to spend right, like any new or emerging technology, you'll pay more at the beginning. So right now, electric vehicles are around 20% more expensive than their petrol or diesel counterparts. And while there are plenty of zeros on the invoice for the AMG behind me, that doesn't mean that you can't access cutting edge electric vehicle technology with models from other manufacturers that are a lot more affordable. The perfect example of a brand trying to balance electric accessibility with demand is Kia. This car here, the EV6, is their first ground-up electric vehicle offering in Australia. And it's sold out with a wait list of over a year. Now, there's no lack of interest for electric vehicles in Australia. In fact, brands are actively trying to get their hands on as much stock as they possibly can. And this is just one of the cars that manufacturers are trying to get a hold of to give buyers more choice. Right now, the most affordable electric car in Australia is the MG ZS EV, an SUV priced at around $45,000 on the road. But with new brands like BYD and GWM Aura joining familiar names like Fiat in launching at the value end of the market, it's set to be a much more competitive marketplace in 2023. That's right, but I'd say it's more of a wave than a tsunami because Australia's compliance rules, the fact that we're a very small right-hand drive market and just the general supply issues that the world is struggling with at the moment are keeping the numbers down, but that's for now. Don't oversize a car because you think you need a battery of 500 kilometres and especially fleets make the mistake of going, yep, everything needs to be 500 kilometre size battery. When we have um, in our Kona EV, for example, two sizes of batteries, but some of those fleets are doing less than 30 to 40 kilometres per vehicle per day. So there's no need to buy that more expensive vehicle with a larger battery. So understand what your driving habits are. And yes, um, you know, people do drive to Queensland. Most people fly because it's cheap. So the emissions target, so you know, people have heard the legislation has gone through Parliament for the 33% emissions target. It's an economy-wide target. I think we have to be realistic, like transport emissions are a pretty big factor. I think they're the largest factor. That's not just, you know, passenger vehicles or um, work vehicles. It's actually you know, heavy vehicles. It's our shipping industry. It's our um, planes are pretty big emitters as well. So, you know, if you take transport as a whole, and there's no really quick, easy solution for planes other than sustainable aviation fuel. Do you think price is the major barrier or where can I charge it? When, when you speak to members of the public, and that's who we're talking about here, right? I think it's both. I think they are, you know, at the moment they're really expensive. Like for, for ordinary Australians, it's, they're pretty expensive. And then I think, you know, most people would prefer if they had an option to be able to plug it in overnight at home. I think, but, you know, again, 
getting that that price is slowly coming down but that, that doing that at home is really expensive knowing where the charging stations are and then there's this issue of range range anxiety that you know we say that uh, am i actually going to be able to charge this somewhere what if i get stuck what happens so really there's there's all of those things at play and you know the ev strategy really is about trying to work on all of those in a measured way to try and remove, as I said, remove the barriers and provide some incentives. Transport's got a role to play. Infrastructure's got a role to play. There's some amazing stuff happening in terms of the circular economy, actually making sure that we reduce carbon in the buildings that we build. So there's lots of really great innovation happening. I think what's been part of the problem is we've basically had the brakes on us for the last decade because, you know, frankly, to be a bit political, we didn't have a government that actually thought this stuff was important. Um, industry sort of doing all sorts of things. It, we've got um, some of the heavy train companies, Orizon, for example, has actually been looking at hydrogen cells in terms of its trains. You've got all this stuff happening. Really what the government's trying to do is say, well, let's actually back you and see if we can sort of incentivise some of this stuff happening a bit more quickly. The, the challenge is supply, and, and, uh, and the supply is intrinsically linked to the um, to the lack of government policy that we've had in Australia for more than a decade. Um, and it hasn't really just been an indifference to policy around electric vehicles and, and climate change. It's almost been hostility, as you, as you heard from the previous government. So we've been hugely encouraged by the new government's approach towards um, climate change in general and the, um, the contribution that transport and electric vehicles will make to that. It'll help manufacturers like ours um, to, uh, to be able to import more electric vehicles to Australia simply because without any legislation we know that other markets that do have such things as fuel efficiency targets um, that they're prioritised for, for the uh, available production and uh, let's face it in, in the US, in, in Europe, in China the, these markets are really burgeoning now with electric vehicles so the demand is, is high. Look at it this way, these are both technologically advanced vehicles from brands we know and trust. Now they're five-seaters, sort of SUVs with good performance range and they represent great value. But that's not all things to all people. For example, if you're wanting a ute or a seven-seater, we're not there yet. So while you may be ready for an electric vehicle, electric vehicles aren't ready for you. That's right, but that won't always be the case. That's the way it is now, but things will change. And the good news is that the current vehicle that you have, whether it's petrol or diesel, you won't have to change that anytime soon. You'll be able to keep driving it as you have been and learn about the new technology before you make the leap. But as fate would have it, as we do with electric vehicles, we're talking about charging again. We're getting Australia ready for electric vehicles. We look at what fast charging your electric vehicle really means and why this is the biggest challenge facing Australian drivers. And don't forget, all the info is at drive.com.au. Earlier when Trent was charging the plug-in hybrid, we talked about charging at 2.4 kilowatts from a standard plug and at seven kilowatts from a wall box. Now that's fine for cars with smaller batteries, but for the 77 kilowatt hour battery in the Kia, we need something with a bit more grunt. DC fast charging allows for up to 350 kilowatts of power if your vehicle can accept it, which means the Kia EV6 that we've been driving can go from 10 to 80% in just 18 minutes. So that is really fast. However, most public charging infrastructure like the charger behind us that we're using at the moment is 50 kilowatts. So that means it's going to take a bit longer. Something like the EV6, you're going to need to park it up for about an hour to get a full charge. And to add some complexity to all of that, not all electric vehicles can be fast charged. Plus, some even require you to bring your own cable. Now, Tesla owners, however, they can benefit from the American brand investing in their very own network. Tesla superchargers only charge Tesla cars and charge it up to around 250 kilowatts. So that means for every five minutes, you get 120 kilometres of range. And so from a regional perspective, yes, we probably do need more publicly available DC charging infrastructure at kind of um, smaller intervals. But for the majority of our regional customers, at least that we've spoken with, they just can't wait for it to come because they know that they can take advantage of on-site solar generation. I think the real challenge comes from ensuring that rural and remote communities are not forgotten in the transition to EVs. 
it's something that certainly JetCharge is working very hard to solve. The thing is, it's easy enough to find something to do while your car is charging, but there's nothing more frustrating than arriving at a charging station, which aren't common enough as it is, and finding a car parked in the spot. Now, that could be the owner of a shop or they've gone off for a jog, so you never know how long that spot's going to be unavailable for. We're a global business and we seek to pursue fast, reliable and convenient charging. And we're really excited to be bringing that business to Australia. Uh, globally, we have ambitions to have 100,000 charge points by 2030. And so we're looking to roll out uh, in BP uh, this month onwards uh, in Australia. Our intentions initially will be to install 50 uh, DC fast chargers across Australia with focuses on the East Coast, so New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland. We have 1,400 uh, BP branded stations across Australia and around another two to 300 in New Zealand as well. So we've got uh, lots of locations where we can roll out EV chargers and they'll be really visible as well. And that's one of the key things we think uh, is important for customers and future EV drivers is to have visible fast charging infrastructure across the country. Well, I think at the moment we see in the market that there's different pricing structures for different speeds. Our focus will be on fast and ultra fast charging um, and that looks like DC chargers, which we're really excited about. And one of the key things we should point out is not all of our customers will charge at BP service stations. Lots of customers will charge at home and that's really convenient for a lot of customers. But when they come to our sites, they'll be guaranteed to have fast, reliable charging. For now though, we need to use dedicated charging facilities. Now, while this one gets its energy back, it's time to try something new. This is the Polestar 2, a new brand of car for a new way of driving. And while it's easy to get in and be on your way, the whole experience of doing so is, well, new. For starters, you don't need to switch the car on. The car knows that I'm here because I have the key on me and once I sit in the driver's seat, it turns itself on. Choose drive or reverse and that's it, you're on your way. Unlike the AMG we saw earlier, there are no drive modes. And unlike the Kia, there are no paddles to adjust braking friction. For the most part, it's just you and the car. The approach that Polestar has taken is one of simplicity. You can see it in the design and you can feel it in the way the car drives. The switch to electric is complex, so why not simplify what you can control? We've looked at the technology and the types of cars. We've looked at charging both out on the road and at home. And we've looked at where we've been, where we are right now, and where we're going. So first, let's go back and have a look at some of the big questions that we asked of our experts. What's the most important piece of advice or insight you can give that customer about an electric vehicle within the Volkswagen Group? Well, I know this from my very own experience. I know the first time I drove uh, an electric vehicle and took it on a reasonably long journey, so I went from Sydney to, uh, to Canberra. Uh, and I was a little bit concerned around the, the, the range. This was a, about a year and a half ago. Uh, that was one journey, and that's the only time I can, I can promise you, Trent, that I felt this thing <laughs> that they call range anxiety. Yep. Because ever since then, I've driven an electric vehicle an awful lot, I drive on regularly. Um, I don't have range anxiety anymore because it's so easy. So what I would say to a customer is that, that there's nothing to be afraid of with an electric car. It's every bit, if not better, than your combustion engine car. And this, these, these issues that you might perceive of, of range anxiety really will, will, will fade away very quickly after probably your first or second drive. And you'll realise just how intuitive and easy it is to use the app and find where the nearest charging station is 
to charge up on your journey and you're, under, you're underway again. It really makes no difference. I've been on longer journeys here to, from here to Byron Bay, which you know, is a very well-trodden route yeah. in an electric vehicle. And it was an absolute joy. So my message to customers is give it a try. You'll be very pleasantly surprised how easy and convenient and, uh, and how thrilling electric vehicles are. Because for my use requirements, while something like that Polestar would be perfect 95% of the time, it's that 5% that I worry about. However, a hybrid, plug-in hybrid would be absolutely perfect for yep. me and something that can do 100 kilometres worth of electric driving range around town and then be able to back up for a petrol engine to go on a longer drive when I need to. Is electric the only option? Synthetic fuels are an important part of the mix, aren't they? They are, and that's why, um, yeah, that's the beauty of our group in that we can we can afford to invest in certain areas like Porsche investing in synthetic fuels, Scania investing in, in hydrogen technology for large, large transport. For passenger vehicles, where we're focused and where we're focused here, obviously in uh, in, in Australia, we're, we're focusing on battery electric. But the, look, the combustion engine is going to be around for a long time yet. We're well placed to be uh, continuing to to look after and service our combustion engine customers as well as the new electric vehicle customers as well. We've spoken about hydrogen. Uh, Porsche and other companies are working on flex fuel and and uh, environmentally friendly fuel options. Are there other technologies on the table that will all become part of the bigger puzzle? For Hyundai, the, the focus is on zero emission, so true zero emission being uh, electric vehicles and hydrogen and fuel cells. So we'll continue to uh, um, evolve our, our range of vehicles now, our drivetrain offerings to true zero emission. Uh, and we'll work on that across both road, rail, marine and air. So we've got a focus on using our uh, EGMP platform for our passenger vehicles and looking at the, the dedicated fuel cell platforms for our passenger vehicles, but also our commercial vehicles. What does the future of public charging look like? Our intentions initially will be to install 50 uh, DC fast chargers across Australia with focuses on the East Coast, so New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland. So we've got uh, lots of locations where we can roll out EV chargers. The idea that life begins at 50, you, a 50 kilowatt charger is really where it's things go. It's got to be a minimum. Absolutely. And so for governments to start looking at that as the infrastructure they need to be putting money into, that's what helps everybody. That's what helps the adoption. We have to really think about how we design our charging stations so that it's not just able-bodied people who can use it, but all people who drive vehicles. A part of the Driving Australia policy is that it actually uh, to work particularly with the NRMA to actually build a network of charging stations across the country. With more than 15% of us now living in apartments, we need to make it much easier for people who live in apartments to install charging stations so that they can charge in their own building. Are electric vehicles affordable? Price is always a barrier, yeah. and yet it's not. Yeah. Because here at the moment in Australia, there is a wait list. The EV6 here has, what, a two-year wait list mm. on it, and that is a $60-plus thousand dollar car. That's right. That is not being held up by its price. Everybody wants a cheap electric car. If you think, and we have said this as a, as a team, the brand that is able to put in a, a viable electric car that starts with a 30-something mm -hmm. will win the day. There hasn't really been any great incentives in terms of EVs. Different states and territories have done different things. We've just introduced um, to, you know, the reduction in tax in terms of EVs because they're still really at that very expensive end. Bringing some of those tax incentives in place, I think, will be important to try and drive the price down. When you look at the whole life cost of an electric vehicle, it's likely to be a lot lower because the running costs are going to be considerably cheaper. There's a, there's a bigger picture to look at than just the, the, the sticker price of the, of the, of the car. But equally, as, a, as I mentioned, the, the more that we're investing in, in, in more and more new models and we're scaling up uh, around the world, um, and we're selling more and more electric vehicles, then like all new technology, then that will become cheaper in time. What does the future look like for electric vehicles in Australia? You're almost going to be able to create your own um, ecosystem that, that charges the car with, with, with bi-directional charging from the solar panels on your roof. Yep. Um, so doing, doing the charging at home, you can almost, it's almost like creating your own fuel at the convenience of your home and it's going to be cheaper, it's going to be less messy uh, and it's going to be much more convenient. So I think, I think that's actually where the vast majority of charging will, will take place. We think electric vehicles can actually be a great equaliser in modern society because we think electric vehicles combined with local renewables like solar has the ability to cut transport and energy costs to almost nothing for most modern Australian families. So Emma, we've heard from the experts. Big question for you though is, what do you think the future of motoring in Australia looks like? 
Well, I think for the consumer, it all sounds positive. But for me, Trent, you know, I'm not going to use the word excited. I think I'm more inclined to say I'm intrigued, but also apprehensive. I mean, I am a rev head like you are. Yeah. I love the sound of an engine. So getting to electric cars, I'm still getting my head around the silence of these vehicles. Also, I've taken a lot of electric cars home and I actually don't even have access to a plug. So that's been a little bit tricky for me. My lifestyle right now, it doesn't suit me. However, it's not all about me. And I think <laughs> if we get the pricing it's right true. and yeah. if infrastructure strengthens, yep. then, you know, if you're in the market for an EV right now, there are some incredible offerings available in Australia and plenty more to come in the future. Yeah, that's right. And look, I think at the moment, the reality is that many, many vehicles on the road already feature some form of electrification. We've talked about hybrids and we've talked about their proliferation into the Australian market. The fact remains, though, that Australia is a huge country, big areas with a very, very strong regional population. We're not the same as Norway. We're about 20 times as big as Norway, and everybody uses Norway as the poster child example of how electric vehicles should be. But Australia is a very different country. I see a future where new cars in Australia, where every single new car in Australia has some form mm. of electrification. And that's the point. We will see, and we know this is coming. You, you talk about the diesel ute. They have just released a brand new Ford Ranger this year. That means that car has at least seven years left on its life calendar. Minimum, yeah. And what we know is that they are talking about having a hybrid option at some point in that car's lifespan. The fact does still remain that the majority of us live around the edges of Australia, on the seaboard near the ocean, and for many people who live in the towns and cities, an electric vehicle does make sense. But the one thing that we've learnt from all of this, Emma, is that the purchase and the path towards an electric vehicle requires a bit of research. Drive is helping Australians get ready for electric cars. That's right, and for everything that we've covered here, and of course the full interviews with all of our experts, head on over to drive.com.au.